Okay, is everybody breathing? That's a pretty intense episode, right? <laughs> Very intense. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jim Halterman. I'm an entertainment reporter for Variety and Mashable and Out.com and a bunch of other places. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah. This show is so good. I'm glad they picked this episode because I rewatched it again today and I was like, there's so much to talk about and it really shows what great acting we're seeing on this show. So let's bring out the actors. Um, you know her from films like Gone Girl and TV like Deadwood, Friday Night Lights, Treme, House of Cards, and she plays Madison Clark in Fear the Walking Dead, Kim Dickens. And you know him from the award-winning autobiographical show, A Boy in His Life, films like Lincoln and the Butler, and on TV, The Nick, and he plays Victor Strand, Coleman Domingo. Thanks for being here, both of you. It's a pleasure. You're welcome. <laughs> Hello. Um, because there's so many actors here, I usually like to start out with a couple of just actor questions. I want to know, what, what was that first acting, not even a job, but the first time you acted, whether it was a little kid or when you first got on stage or did something? For me, should I go first? Um, it was in college, Vanderbilt University. Nashville, Tennessee, and I did. I, I took an acting class. It wasn't my major, and I took an acting class, and I auditioned for my first play, and then I got it. It was Sexual Perversity in Chicago. It's a great play. <laughs> Sold out every night. <laughs> <laughs> so, so was acting not the plan at the time? You kind of fell into it, or? I think I was still afraid to do it, and it's not, it just wasn't my major to start. I, I didn't come from any sort of background and schooling in it or anything, and um, but my mother had taken me to New York when I was about 14, me and my stepsisters and my stepsisters and me, and took us to New York and it blew my mind. And that's, that's when I first started thinking, I've got to do what I can do to get to New York City. And then, and then uh, I did my first play and then that was it. Yeah. You got the bug. Yeah. Okay, Coleman, how about you? What was that first, first time you were on stage or did something? Well, the first time I was on stage was in elementary school and uh, there was a, a play about the 50 states. And I went to an all-black school, and I had the most uh, Latin last name, Domingo, so they dressed me up as New Mexico, and I went on stage. <laughs> and I just said, New Mexico! And I sat down. And, and was that the, did the bug get you right No, then the bug there? did not get me then. No, it didn't get me at all. Uh, actually, the bug didn't hit me until I was about uh, 20 years old. And um, I took uh, an acting class as an elective at Temple University. And, um, and it was the first time someone, uh, this teacher named Chris, he told me that uh, he asked me to interrogate uh, this, uh, this, this art form because he believed that I had a gift in it. And it was the first time someone told me I had a gift. And uh, I really started to pursue it. And, uh, and then uh, here I am sitting next to Kim Dickens. Only one year later, since I'm 21. <laughs> I'm going to take you back, though, both of you. What was, what was that job that got you your SAG card? Do you remember? Um, an independent film called Palookaville. And it was directed by Alan Taylor. It was his first movie. And do you know Alan Taylor? Big director, did Thor. He won an Emmy for... Sopranos directing. He directed the pilot for Mad Men. He's fantastic. So that was his first movie. And it also starred Vincent Gallo. And I played his teenage lover in New Jersey. How about you, Coleman? Mine was for the California Lotto. <laughs> yeah, I got my SAG card for the California Lotto. And I had a little dog in the commercial. And, um, and I don't know, I guess I was hustling people to, you know, buy tickets for the lotto. <laughs> okay, I've never heard that kind of answer before. That's great. I love it. I love it. Um, Do you know what I did for, for, with, without getting paid or a SAG card or anything? I was a, my first real time on a set, I was a stand-in for a public service announcement against the use of pesticides or educating you how to wash off pesticides. And the star that, they, uh, that I stood in for was Meryl Streep. She was doing the good work back then. 
did, did you guys, did either one of you do a lot of, <laughs> do a lot of extra work or a lot of things you hear actors are doing, you know, just to kind of get their foot in the door? I, I didn't. I, I, did a, I did one um, extra job uh, in a film called Metro um, years ago. And I, you know, I, I was, I used to, I've done many things. I used to be in the circus. I don't know if you even know that. But, <laughs> but, but the room started to spin when he just said that. I can't but, believe that's true. But yeah, but I, 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 I used to uh, stilt walk on five feet tall stilts, and they needed a stilt walker, and so um, I sort of crossed frame and and did that, and that was one of my first jobs on a film set. But for me, that's also been my university and all my training, because uh, you know I thought you have to do every sort of job, you know, understand what background artists do and how they're really, you know, how they hold up a production in, in many ways. Um, and so for me, I just want to, wanted to learn as much as possible in many different types of sets. And, uh, you know, so I, I took it all as part of my, my, my university. Well, look, I was looking at both of your credits today and I would say eclectic comes to mind. There's so many different kinds of things on there, whether it's film, stage, television. When you were getting started, what was kind of your objective for your career? I don't know if you even think in those terms, you're just trying to get a job and then the next job, but did you kind of have a vision what you at least wanted your career to look like? Um, I don't think I did. I think I just, you know, I was in acting school in New York and I loved Tennessee Williams and all those plays and I just thought it was gonna be, like acting class and you know just I had no idea what it was going to be like even though I was a fan of theater and film and all that I didn't know what it would look like to actually be a part of it and um, I just wanted to you know be able to quit my waiting tables job. <laughs> I agree I wonder if you even um, most people I know sometimes I, I go to universities and talk to students and they have this idea of wanting to get it right and have all the right answers and this is what you do uh, to have a career. And there really isn't in a way. You really, you have this path that, you know, you, it, the ebbs and flows and you, you hopefully say yes and, and you're generous and you show up and you learn as much as you can and your career takes you on the path that you're supposed to be on. I, someone asked me before, like, did, did I have aspirations to be on Broadway? I thought, no, I didn't. And it's not that I wasn't thinking big in that way, if that's big. I just wanted to create and tell stories. And I, I can tell them whether they're in a, a 50 seat basement or uh, you know, doing an independent film or something. But one thing leads to another and then you look back in your career and you're like, okay, I've been following this path and mine has been about learning and, uh, and doing things that, you know, that scare me a little bit, honestly. Like even doing, uh, being a part of Fear the Walking Dead, it was actually, I had an option to do one or another thing, and this was the thing that scared me the most. I just didn't understand it. And I thought, well, here's a time in my career, and as I've been now been in my career for about 25 years, I thought, I wanna do things, I mean, this is, I, I'm not sure about it, I don't know. I, it's a character I don't understand, and you know, and a company of artists that uh, I'm intrigued by, and once again, it's another opportunity to learn and grow. How do you get to that point where if you do feel scared, it doesn't chase you in the other direction. Instead, you run towards whatever that job might be. I, I really don't know. Um, I, just, I don't know. I don't know if it's through training, you know? If it's uh, the people you surround yourself with. I don't know. I think, you know, some of the keys to being an actor and working, I think there's talent luck, I think, and I think a really important ingredient is perseverance. And I think a, a lot of times, you know, it is what can prevent people from doing, you know, going for their passion in the arts because of the risks involved. And it, it, it does take a lot of courage. It does. It is scary. Well, Coleman, talk about the fear that led you to this world. It's a good segue to talk about Fear the Walking Dead because here we have this humongous TV franchise and it's kind of the first spin-off or companion series, whatever you want to call it. What, what was your fear, especially in, in, in your preconceptions? Because I think viewers had preconceptions and I'm sure both of you did too going into it. Yeah, well, well you know, I think, you know, after a while you think that you, I think a lot of times you start to think that, oh, this is who I am as an artist, as a, as a craftsman. This is what I do based on the body of my work. 
and then someone says, but hey, I, I see you this way as well, have, have this other opportunity. You're like, I don't understand that. And um, that's what this was for me. I, re I actually just um, joined with a, a new agency and this is one of the first auditions they had for me. And then I thought, well, they, they must not know me at all. I do, I do <laughs> historical dramas and, and things like that. You know, I do Shakespeare and I'm like, Fear the Walking Dead. I'm like, zombies, I don't understand. I, I, I'd never watched The Walking Dead. I had no idea at all. Um, I, didn't, like, I was living under a rock. I had no idea. Apparently, it was like the, the number one television show. <laughs> it's, it's big. Like, worldwide, it's, it's big. huge. Um, and, and <laughs> yeah, so I thought, um, I, I, well, I'll just say I had the, it, the beautiful opportunity at, at one moment. The thing that I had to choose between was uh, uh, Baz Luhrmann's series, the get, the get Down and Fear the Walking Dead. And I thought, and I'll, and I'll, honestly, and I'll tell you this, I'm not, not just because you're sitting here, I thought, wow, here's, um, they told me Kim Dickens and Cliff Curtis, and I was like, oh my gosh, these are two craftsmen that I really admire, and I would love to be in a room and play with them. And then I saw Frank Delane and Alicia Debnam Carey and, and then Ruben Blades, and I was like, well, this is gonna be fun, and these are people I've never worked with, and. I'm, I'm excited and, and up for that challenge. And to come in so late in the game in the season, I would come in like, you know, episode five or something. And, and that was even more terrifying because, you know, they, they had established so much of, um, of a, a family, a familiarity, um, uh, the style that it was already moving. And then I was going to jump on board. And um, I just wanted to, to not mess up. Basically, I just, wanted to, I just wanted to come in and like not hurt anything and break it, you know? So I think, but, be, but it wasn't, I, I think most of us, we had never really experienced, you know, the Walking Dead universe. And so we're able to come in it and actually create without any, anything hanging over our heads. I, I don't think that, okay, I want to live up to this brand or anything like that. You can't create work that way. You just come in and I want to, it's the day to day of, you know, working and building character and, and trust and love in the company, yeah. Kim, how about you when you first started talking to the producers about being a part of this? Um, when I was first given the opportunity to audition for it, I just passed because I'd, I'd just finished four years on Treme in New Orleans and I was recurring on House of Cards at the time and I got the call and I, so I was at a point in my life where I thought, well, what's the next marriage you know where do I really commit for a while and I didn't know the genre I don't really I didn't follow The Walking Dead I didn't I don't like scary things you know I don't like to watch <laughs> you, uh -oh. you wouldn't tell by some of the things she does <laughs> but I like to do them <laughs> yeah so it turns out <laughs> so I I just said no because you because you also have to like realize you you're working am I going to dedicate my time to go in for this and really work on the character and audition and fly home? And, and I just thought, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's for me. I don't think I'm going to be the one they want. And I don't think I fit. And all these reasons. I just had a big list. And then, so then they left me alone. And then they came back around and they said, are you sure you don't want to go audition? And I said, I'm sure. I didn't, and, and I guess they just, you know, I knew, I knew the, the director for the pilot. I'd worked with him before and the, and the showrunner I'd met before. So they had me come in and talk to them and I read the script and it was just a page turner, you know, and I loved the characters so much. All the characters were so compelling and real. There weren't, they weren't, you know, just a genre pieces, you know, um, they were three dimensional and complicated and real and, and, you know, it turns out it's a metaphor. It turns out we're trying to kill our zombies every day, you know, and it's just, it was so relatable and it's really fun to do. So anyway, I ended up auditioning and, and boy, they put me through the ringer. I had to test and audition and do all this stuff, and then I got it. And I, I don't know, it's just sometimes you gotta say yes to life, you know? <laughs> and so, and it's been, a, it's been just the greatest job. So fun, so challenging. What, tell, tell me how the challenges as an actor in, in a show like this, because when I watch, especially watching these last couple episodes of this, this first half of the second season, the tension is so there all the time. It's not, I mean, you, it gets higher at points, but it just starts out at such a high point. Is that a challenge for both of you to kind of just be able to get to that and go into instead of the slow build that you might get on another kind of show? I'll be honest, some, some days it's hard to like maintain that level. So, sometimes it is, it, it depends on 
they were the, well, the, in this first half, I had some heavy duty emotional work and to maintain that it was like, let's say a full day of like, oh my God, what else is gonna happen to me or, um, but, but you know that that's, um, you just try to be as honest as you can and give it all that you've got. I do find there's sometimes where I just, because you're playing at such a high level at times, there was, <laughs> there was one moment where Kim and I. It's in the gag reel, right? <laughs> it's in the gag reel when we're running out and it's like, <laughs> It's just, I won't tell you because it may be a spoiler, but it's such high drama. It's, it's all happening, and then you felt the camera was coming towards you as well. They were doing a, a move like this, and we're running out, and I just, <laughs> I just busted out laughing. I said, and it's on our gag reel. I said, I'm so sorry. I just feel so melodramatic right now. I just, <laughs> I just could not get myself together, and we just fell over laughing. Yeah. Because it was just a lot going you on. You're overacting. I was overacting. I was like, I was <laughs> chewing the scenery, and I knew it. I had my dial was way up because it was just like, <gasps> what's going? <on?" laughs> and, it felt, and I felt, I saw myself, and I was like, I look crazy right now. <laughs> just dial it way down, okay? <laughs> How do you deal with it, Kim? How do you deal with him? <laughs> deal with me, Kim. Oh my God, I don't want to give anything away, but we, we really. I really love working with you. I do, and and um, I, I, who knew? You know, we just get to do some really great stuff this season, and um, we we just show up, and we're both ready to play, and really prepared, and ready to work hard, and and then we will die laughing, and then can't get it together. You know, like the church giggles for a while, but but it's so fun. Like we really we really work hard and well together. I think, but. I think it's, for me, it's been the hardest I've ever had to work. <laughs> I'm like, wow, because I have been a lot of the stuff. I'm in a lot of it. And it's a marathon. You got to take care of yourself. You, you know, every weekend. It's really physical. It's well. very physical. And, and that's what's so fun about it. I love that extra challenge. And, and that keeps you engaged. You know, you got to, you can't misstep when you're running up a million stairs at top speed. And, you know, and you've got to say lines and you got to grab somebody and, you know. All that stuff's really fun, and the killing the zombies is really fun too. But so, so you have that to look forward to while you're working so hard. But um, it's a marathon, and I find that I had to. Every weekend was about breaking down the next episode and the next week's work, and and doing it sequentially, and then doing it as it would come in the week, and then just I spent my weekends really preparing, and and um, in the last couple episodes. We didn't have that luxury because we were getting schedules changing, and it's it's hard. You got to be on your toes, you know. Well, t talk about the relationship between your characters because it definitely in these episodes you start to see that there is, you know, the word friend is thrown out there, and it's but it's a very reluctant friendship. It feels like, but talk about that because it wasn't what I saw coming, and all of a sudden you get to these episodes, and, and I watched the finale. If you guys have not seen the next episode, it's the mid-season finale. It's so good. So make sure it's on it's on the AMC website. I don't want to give anything away that happens there, but there is kind of a friendship there that I think both of you are maybe are fighting or surprised about, but talk about that from the start and then up to this point in the series. Um, I think our characters in early on, there was, um, we recognized something in each other and didn't necessarily like it, mm -hmm. I think, or trust it. And, but yet there was a sense of a kindred spirit there. So we would sort of go to each other for information and yet have really good boundaries with each other and not trust each other still and and then it it sort of um evolved into saving each other's lives and how that changed us i agree with everything she just said <laughs> it's been really fun to watch i want to know what happens next but don't don't tell us um so I want to talk about just when you found out about Victor's backstory, because it was a big episode, because we had seen you for a couple episodes, thinking you were the villain. We talked about that backstage. And then we find out this whole backstory with you know, the, the love that you have for Thomas and the, you know, the mother, Celia, comes into it a lot more in the later episodes. But talk about which, what, you were, what you talked about with the producers going in. Well, when we first talked about uh, uh, Victor Strand and who Abigail was in uh, season one, Abigail was actually... And I, I remember Dave saying, you know, Abigail's possibly your daughter. And so, but in Abigail, it was just a little ambiguous, but Abigail's a person that you love. Because I know that, I think the writers, they may know, but then they're trying to see where it's going themselves. I think they're a little open as well and seeing what is the, the most complex to build a complex human being. 
And so by the time I, I went to the writer's room uh, before season two, they said, um, so uh, what do you, um, Abigail, Abigail is, uh, is Thomas Abigail. And I thought, okay, that's great. And so we wanted to talk about what I love about how they've been um, devising uh, Victor Strand. Um, and it's all in the writer's room. It's all, you know, it's just, it's what they, it's, it's on the page, or I can't play it. You know, it's like peeling away an onion, really. And there's more and more layers to them. And just when you think you know something, there's a bit more. You have to go a little deeper, a little deeper. And that's why I even enjoyed about the backstory, because I really thought, like, objectively, I thought, wow, if people, if that's all they get from his backstory, is that he's got a relationship with Thomas Abigail. I think they're missing the whole point. That, that, that's just, okay, now you know another thing about him. But you also need to know how he operates and what is it about and the, val the values that he has. That it's about opportunity or is it really about love or is it about obligation? Um, and for me, I like to keep those secrets. And, you know, isn't it, I had a great conversation with um, the, the director of that episode right before a very, a very significant moment. Um, is it in this episode? It is. Do I? In this episode? Okay, okay. <laughs> so, so right before I, I shoot Thomas Abigail, and, um, and we were, she and the writer thought the scene was one thing, and I believed I was playing something else, and so we had to come to an agreement on what it was exactly. And, um, you know, actors have their secrets on what it is. They're like, you know, a writer may think, oh, it's true love. But then the actor may think, well, is it? I said, because I think, I think it's more interesting to play the most complex version of it in a way. Like, you know, if, is it about, is his uh, systems of value about obligation? Could, could Abigail have been a woman? That's also possible too. Where is Victor Strand in his need and what he needs and how does he survive? And I think that's very interesting to make an even more complex human being to say, yeah, it, he can, he, maybe he ebbs and flows with what works for him. And then surprisingly, maybe it does develop into something more. We don't know. But I like, I like the idea of, of developing and creating a character that doesn't have easy answers. Um, and so just when you see one thing, maybe the next episode, it turns around and you're like, wait a minute. You know? But also I think that's what Victor Strand, what they've been writing as well, is that he's, the more he opens up, sometimes he'll just he'll shut down when he needs to, to protect himself. One of my questions here is, why do you think he made the choice he made at the end? Is that something you want to talk about? Why did he make the choice? That I, I honestly think, I think it was a mercy kill, to be honest. I think, it, I think that he, he cared for Thomas Abigail. And I personally think, I mean, I think, you know, you know, I could be wrong. The writers can write something different tomorrow. But I think, you know, I, I think every actor has got to believe that, I believe that, I believe that probably the one, of most, one of the most wicked people right now that's probably in a media, um, he probably believes he's a good person and he's got good intentions. I think Jim Jones believed that he had good intentions. I, I believe any, anyone who, I believe you really, you have to believe I have good intentions, I'm a good person. I believe, the Vic, I believe the Victor, that's Victor Strand and he's doing a good deed, you know, and uh, it may be seen as something else from Celia or someone else, but. For him, I believe that he, he always believes he's doing good. Kim, talk about Madison a little bit. Watching these, especially at this point again in the series, I feel like she's trying constantly to connect with people and protect people, and, and she gets shut down a lot. Like, she can't connect with Nick. You know, she tries to. Alicia, they seem to be in a good place, at least at this point. But even Travis, he's kind of off. They're not connecting. Talk about what your process was or just what you were thinking about with these episodes and what, what her objective is at this point. I think Madison's objective has always been to, you know, take care of her family, and um, there lies the obstacle all season. I mean, my mic's still on, um, because her son is is going to do his own thing. Her daughter is uh, they have a very fractured relationship, and and Travis has to mind after his own son. So they're all it's a fractured family, but it's also um, a beautiful family. But it, it has very relatable problems, I think, especially with the teens, with drug addiction and in the past, and with the golden child not getting enough attention, with the new husband or boyfriend and his ch his child, and all that all that brings to the plate. And then you then you add the apocalypse in. So 
when things get tough. Like, which, is, which is worse, the apocalypse or the family Or the family. <laughs> Um, how have both of you taken the attention on the show and, and the success of the show? It's doing really well, got renewed really fast, and is doing great. But how, how have you taken all that in, just knowing that there are a lot of eyeballs on the work you're doing? I've had nothing but the most um, outpouring of uh, love and support, truly. Um, constantly on the street, any, any of the fans of the show, they're the warmest and most generous. In particular, and I'll, I'll say this because I've noticed that there was a pattern, and in particular, the people who stop me all the time are African-American men. And they not only stop me because they're, they say that, first of all, they always, they always ask, are you gonna live, are you gonna live? <laughs> but also I realized that maybe even possibly in the, in the zeitgeist, in the world, in the universe, they wanna know if a black man is gonna survive in the world and the apocalypse, I've, I, I've been taking it as, it seems like a bigger question. Um, not knowing if this is the purpose of it in any way, but it feels that way, because it seems that they, they seem to have hopes and dreams and, and wishes in a character like this, in this universe. And uh, I think uh, it's, it's really, makes me feel good. Kim, has this been a different experience for you? Just, you've been on a lot of hit shows, but this, this feels like a different beast from where I sit. Yeah, it is. It is. It it's nice to to know that it's being seen, and it really is. It's reaching so many people, and that's been very exciting. Just like going to to Spain to promote it in other countries has been a new thing for me. I haven't done that with other series, and so it's kind of incredible. And it's. I mean, I just wanted to be a part of storytelling because I wanted to be a part of the experience of, you know, bringing it to the audience. You know, I wanted, to, I wanted to be a part of that. And it's nice to see it reaching so many people. That's, that's, it doesn't always happen like that. And it's been, it's been really fun. And they, and they are very generous and it's a very passionate fan base. And, you know, you come under their scrutiny a little bit too, but that's okay. You know, it's, uh, you just, we just show up every day and try to do the best we can and tell these stories in an honest way. And, and, um, but it's mostly they're just excited and passionate about it. And, that, and that's exciting to be a part of. Uh, you know, social media is such a big part of a show like this. And I think with any TV show these days. But have, ha, how, how's your social media game? Yeah, I could be better. I could be way better. You could be better. You could be I, better. I probably hire someone to do <laughs> mine, right? I should do that. I'm going to do it. I'm going to okay. hire me. I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Coleman's doing mine for now. <laughs> no, but I, it's every so often I get somebody like if they're watching an episode, you know, of me like you know, chopping uh, the raft and letting you know sickly children go off on a raft. I'll get a, a Twitter message saying I hate you <laughs> at Coleman Domingo, and I'm like, me? What? And and I'm, and, I, and then I try, I try not to take it personal. I'm like, no, I'm I'm Coleman Domingo. I'm not Victor Strand. It's okay. No, I didn't do anything. <laughs> Now I know I know the the, the first six episodes f were one thing, and then the second season, at least the first half, felt like a, the, kind of the next chapter. Without spoiling anything, what is kind of the next half of season two, which we don't start seeing until August? But does it also have a whole different feel, or is it just kind of a fluid? Movement? I think they all the scripts surprised me so much. They went in directions that I didn't anticipate at all, and I'm certainly not a writer, but but you know, in this um, first half of of season two. We were on the water, left the water, made it to land, and we do stay on land pretty much. We, you know, I, I can't tell everything, but it, it, we just go in places that I never imagined. Uh, if that's anything. Something. We'll take anything at this point. We'll take anything. Um, it's coming up soon, right? Yeah. Yeah. August. August twenty-first. So yeah, um, we do have a couple of questions from people in the audience. So. Of course, with a show like this, I see everything online. Um, a lot of theories um, connecting this show to the mothership, The Walking Dead. So, um, Vesna, where's Vesna? She's in the back. She wants to know that there's a theory going around that Madison may be a Dixon. Oh my God! I have you heard this? No, I didn't hear Darryl, it. Daryl Dixon it. from The Walking Dead. If you guys know Norman Reedus's maybe character, maybe we would be, you know, cousins or brother and sister or something. What do you, what do you think that. of that? Or when you hear of I, things like that? It sounds cool. Sounds fun. Sounds like it'd be really fun to play, but I don't know if, 
I've heard nothing of a crossover or anything. But I said that too in my own head. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Maria wants to know for both of you, uh, how do you how do you, uh, how do you prepare mentally and emotionally for your role? Because they, they do go through a lot of different things, like the scene, the last scene you have with uh, with Thomas, such a great scene. How do, how do you prepare for a scene like that? I think you you, you <laughs> well, first of all, you 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 prepare as much as you can to know as much as you can, and then you try to let, like John Patrick Shanley would say, leave room for the divine to reside. And you really try to just, just try to be as honest as possible and put yourself, I'm the kind of actor that believes that you, we, you, know, you have to put, you have to bring so much of yourself as well and your heart, your love and what would happen, who is that person for you? I don't do a lot of substitution. I just try to deal with, you know, Du Gray and I, we got to know each other. You know, we got to know each other as comrades. We, we, we have a laugh together. And I would try to play that situation as if, you, you know, in all the stakes of what's built and what's um, written there. And um, just try to find something honest about it. That's it. And, and honestly, get out of the way. Get out of your head and, um, and let it happen. Um, I'm, I'm getting the episodes mixed up, but I think in this episode is when they first arrive at the house and there is kind of a, they have to do some killing, right? That's a, at the church. At the church, yes. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, it's still the same episode, so, yeah. So, Kim, talk about uh, how do you prepare for a scene like that? Because, like you said, it's probably fun just to know you maybe are going to kill some some walkers or something. But what, what's the preparation for a role like that? Because for the character, it's a very serious, intense moment. Yeah, well, I think, you know, it is written so well that if you're, you know, ready and, and prepared and playing for truth and playing as grounded and honest as you can, you know your relationships and where you're all your people are and what they're doing. You're just, you've got all that work done and you can show up with these great directors and, and, and um, it was Kate, Kate Dennis, I believe, on that one, Australian director and, and the, the writer that's on set and, and you can be flexible, you know, with direction and stuff. And, and for those scenes, we, had to, we usually do um, stunt training the day before or a few days before where we go with the stunt team and they've sort of blocked out what it is and the stunt people will show us what it is and then we'll do it, do it and do it at stunt training until we get it, which is really quick. We go, it's like really doesn't last that long. Like they see how much you can do and where they have to throw somebody in for you. But mostly our stunts are like real people's stunts, you know? So they want us to do these basic sort of clumsy things sometimes and, and they'll just protect us if like in my case in that church scene I had to fall over a body and so they just you know she took the hit on the ground because it's dangerous and she's trained better <laughs> yeah so, so by season three or four we might see you guys doing backflips and the choreographer yeah. will really yeah. you never we've know. been doing a lot we've been climbing we've, buildings we've been, we've been in the water we've oh, been doing I've everything I've been in the ocean and way deep anyway I can't say, <laughs> I can't say anymore <laughs> What's the challenge in that, though? I'm guessing you haven't done things like this in your career before, have you? Is this brand new for both of you? Yeah, it's brand new for me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, what have I done? I've done things, but not like this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I couldn't think of I, any action. action I did kind of Hollow thing. Man. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I no, but I, I've done. I did Hollow Man, and that was a horror film years and years ago, and so there were. There was a lot of CGI and some stunt stuff there. I remember there was a bloody battle scene with, with Kevin Bacon, who was the Invisible Man, and, and my death scene, I had to throw blood bags on him so that I could see him, because the blood would land on him, and so that took five days. But I've done some things like that, but uh, this is something that's like an, on an almost daily basis where, you know. Let me tell you something, and this one right here is the most hardcore. She's fantastic, because, <laughs> They constantly, and I'm starting to wonder because you know they they con anytime we're doing fight scenes or somebody's getting killed or bashed or something, <laughs> they give Kim Dickens the biggest dude in the place to like <laughs> knock over the head with a bottle or something, and I usually have s some skinny little girl coming at me <laughs> consistently. I'm like, I'm like, wait a minute, I get the little girl again, and, Kim, Kim, and Kim's like, Ugh, uh, uh, and I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, I'm like, why'd you hit that little girl with a chair? 
think we need to see this gag reel. That's what I want to see. Awesome. Well, thank you both for being here and talking about the show. And sure. August 21st, Fear the Walking Dead is back. So thanks for being here. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot.